Hello, History 363. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the geography of Italy um, and um, think about how that geography is actually going to shape um, the history of uh, both early Rome um, and really almost everything that follows afterwards. I mean, during this video, let me just say this, I'm not necessarily trying to make a case for geographical determinism, that the geography necessarily somehow predestined Rome to greatness. Um, that would be silly. But in the pre-modern world, lacking the technology, transportation and communication technologies that we use today, in, including the fact that I'm talking to you through a computer using fiber optic cables, um, geography matters a great deal. Um, and indeed, you should always sort of, when you think about history, why do uh, places, settlements, um, uh, activities, trade, commerce, military movements, why do they happen the way they do? Oftentimes, they're deeply um, influenced by the actual uh, 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 topography. Um, you know, we can even think, uh, sitting here in Albany, um, there's a reason that Albany is where it is, the fact that it's actually very close to the confluence of two very important rivers, um, the, the Hudson and the Mohawk, which eventually connects to the Great Lakes with the Erie Canal. That explains why the city is, is here, why it became the capital, um, and uh, why it's uh, you know, remained at the modest hub that it is even today. Um, uh, you know, even as we now have a lot of technologies from interstate highways to airplanes that, that, that you know, don't require us to fall back on riverine transport. Um, so let's just sort of look at Italy as a whole. Um, one thing that is notable about Italy, as with actually most of the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is a geological dog's breakfast. Uh, it really represents the remnants of three ancient continents that are mashed up on top of each other. Um, and uh, so as a result, it's deeply mountainous. Um, uh, the Italian peninsula is to a degree separated from the rest of continental Europe by the, the, Alp, the Alps. Um, now, the Alps have pa passes and passages, passageways that allow for, among other things, say Hannibal to get through, um, but also for a pretty brisk movement of goods and persons, particularly in the spring and summer. I mean, the, the thing that makes the Alps such an um, impressive barrier to Hannibal is the fact that he wants to cross in the winter. Um, but the Alps do, to a degree, um, uh, separate physically um, Italy from continental Europe. Um, in northern Italy, what is today northern Italy, um, we then have the Po River, um, which uh, f the Po and its tributaries form a large fertile plain in northern Italy. And today that is the most economically productive part of Italy. That's where Milan is and the fashion and the fast cars and the, and the industry. Um, now, uh, Back in the day, this is acknowledged as some of the most productive and important agricultural land in what, I, what today we would call the Italian peninsula. Very importantly, in Roman times, they do not call this area Italy. The, the, the Po River Valley, what's north of the Apennines, is considered Gaul. It is settled um, in the 6th and 5th century by uh, Celtic-speaking peoples. Um, and therefore, the Romans refer to the Po Valley um, as Cisalpine Gaul, Gaul that is on our side of the Alps. And this is opposed to Transalpine Gaul, Gaul on the other side of the Alps, both inhabited by Gauls or Celts. Um, but uh, uh, they consider that, they consider what, again, what we would today call Northern Italy, Gaul. Um, uh, even, even though they do conquer it, um, over the course of the 3rd and 2nd centuries um, BC. Um, so, uh, this, this, so anyway, the, what Cisalpine Gaul uh, represents this very important uh, fertile agricultural land and indeed a major target of Roman imperialism as the Republic progresses. Um, Italy itself is defined by the spine that were of the Apennine Mountains uh, that run from north to south and actually continue despite the brief interruption uh, uh, in, in many ways geologically into um, Sicily. Um, uh, the Apennine Mountains uh, are, are, not, are nowhere near as steep or as imposing in the Alps, and indeed they have 
various uh, uh, pasture lands and glades and, and meadows and places where you can engage in both pastoralism and um, a degree of agriculture. Um, now, the Apennines hug more closely to the eastern coast. So uh, there's less coastal plain where you have really good agricultural land on the eastern side of Italy than on the western side of Italy. And on the western side, you have three big plains um, uh, uh, that are really important for sort of shaping the human geography of Italy. Um, the northernmost plain, which is actually kind of the most um, mountainous, or that you have a lot of alternations between mountains and, uh, and agricultural um, uh, sort of uh, valleys. Um, uh, and, and indeed, that's why it's such a nice place to visit today, is what we would like call Tuscany. Um, but the, the Romans would call it Etruria. This is the, the region that is inhabited by a people called the Etruscans. Um, it is an area that is um, um, decent for agricultural, but happens to be very um, richly endowed with metal resources, particularly bronze, or sorry, particularly uh, not bronze, copper and iron. Um, one, one metal resource that is almost entirely lacking from Italy is silver, um, but there's a lot of bronze, which explains why primitive Italian uh, money systems are almost all based on lump bronze. It's, 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 a, it's a resource that's extremely common in, in his mind. Um, uh, the copper, of course, you add a little bit of tin to that copper to make bronze. So we have Etruria as our sort of first uh, coat plane. Um, then in the center, we have Latium, um, and uh, this is where Rome is. It's in, in Latium is primarily inhabited by Latin-speaking peoples um, who speak the, a Latin or a related language. Um, and it is actually a, a kind of a, a good mix. It's got some metallic resources, copper and, and, and iron particularly, um, uh, but also has pretty good agricultural land. Um, now, the Tiber River is actually the, the sort of feature that separates um, Latium from Etruria, and then it flows up into the Apennines. Um, one important thing about the Tiber River, for most of its length, it just floods its banks uncontrollably. So there are actually very few communities, big communities, that are directly on the Tiber. Even though, for the purposes of transportation, you want riverine transport. It is incredibly expensive to transport goods by land. In fact, we, we know from Diocletian's price edict, it's about 10 times more expensive to transport goods on a wagon than it is to put them on a boat and put them on a river. So if you are a community that wants to engage in, in commerce, you want to be on a river. It's hard to be on most places in the Tiber though, precisely because uh, you can't get too close. You can't put your city too close because you will constantly, constantly getting washed out. With one exception. Um, the location of Rome, which is prone to flooding, but precisely because Rome has this kind of escarpment, um, a kind of little uh, vestigial bit coming off the Apennines that gives us the seven hills of Rome, um, there's actually places where you can build a house with the reasonable expe expectation that it won't get f completely washed away the next time the Tiber floods. So this is one advantage that Rome has as a, as, a, as a good place to found a city. It's on the Tiber River. You can then ship goods in particularly down the Tiber River to Ostia and then access the, the super highway that is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, also importantly, um, the uh, Tiber narrows and there's, there's an island, the so-called Tiber Island, um, that you can still cross on a bridge today. Um, and this is a very good place to either ford or bridge the Tiber River. So it's actually not only a place that you can put your city close to the Tiber and not get flooded, it also is the best place to cross the Tiber. And therefore, any good that's coming up from uh, Campania to Latium to Etruria or going the other way, um, this is going to be a major hub. So again, I'm not necessarily arguing geographic determinism, but you can see why a village, community, eventually city, um, might arise right there on Rome. It's on the Tiber River, through the Tiber you can access the Mediterranean, and you also are perfectly positioned to um, uh, be part of trade that's moving along the western coast of Italy between these three big plains. Then to the south, we have Campania, that's our third plane. It is not as richly endowed, it has very little, few metallic resources, 
Um, but it does have amazing agriculture. Probably has the best agriculture um, of many places in Italy. This is, among other things, where the famous uh, Falernian wine is grown. So this is known for being a very rich, productive uh, 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 agricultural uh, area um, and is going to be very important. Uh, you know, the, the Romans, let's say, will, will uh, be very interested in Campania for a, uh, at a very early date. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the Roman conquest of Italy. But those are our sort of three plans on the western side. Now, one thing that does happen as the Apennine Mountains, which for the most part hug the eastern coast closely, there are some modest plains like uh, Picenum, um, but uh, there, there aren't, the plains are nowhere near as broad as Campania or Latium or, or the more rugged plain of Etruria. Um, but the Apennine Mountains then curve around towards the, uh, the toe of the boot, and this creates actually a huge plain um, that uh, I'm going to call Apulia. Um, uh, and so this is actually, this in some ways, on the eastern side, this is sort of the biggest plain, which then extends down into the, the heel of the boot. Um, and this is actually the horse country in Italy. Um, uh, this is the better, there, there's enough wide open spaces to, to graze horses and, and pasture them and exercise them that um, uh, uh, the, the sort of best cavalry probably among, you know, come from among other places, um, Apulia. So um, that's our sort of plain on the, on the south, um, uh, excuse me, the south um, eastern uh, part of Italy. Um, so that's a very brief, down and dirty sort of geographic discursus. Um, now, um, if you are to arrive in, say, the um, uh, uh, 600 BC, um, Italy is nowhere close to being politically unified um, and is populated by peoples who speak dozens of different kinds of languages. Now, most of these languages, maybe almost all of them, um, are Indo-European. They're part of the Indo-European language family, which includes German and English and uh, Hittite and Greek and Sanskrit. So uh, uh, Indo-European encompasses a, a, a very wide breadth of uh, European and Iranian and, and uh, even Indian languages. Um, it seems that almost all Italian languages are Indo-European. There is a bit of debate, and I, I, I don't have a, a horse in that race, as to whether Etruscan is Indo-European. Um, Etruscan, the people, the Etruscans, the people who live in and around Etruria, um, speak a language in which they use a modified version of the Greek alphabet um, to inscribe. So we have a lot of Etruscan inscriptions. Unfortunately, 90% of these are proper names, which don't give us great insight into actually how the, the grammar and, uh, of this language works. Um, and so there is debate, is this, there are some linguists who think this is a non-Indo-European language, a language that, that perhaps existed before Indo-European peoples migrated into Italy and, and Therefore, it's this kind of pocket of, of non-Indo-European. And there, there, there are pockets of non-Indo-European, most notably the Basques, um, the Basques who live in the Pyrenees between France and Spain. That is actually a genuine non-Indo-European language that has survived up in the Pyrenees um, uh, to this day. Um, there are other linguists who think, no, this, what little fragments we have of Etruscan suggest it may be related um, to some Anatolian languages that are Indo-European, and, and therefore it is, a, it is another, if somewhat different, Indo-European language. It's still being debated. Uh, there may be something more conclusive will come to light, but um, suffice it to say, almost all the other languages, including Latin, are without question um, uh, uh, Indo-European. Um, now, the Etruscans are the first people in Italy um, to really um, uh, uh, engage in a kind of a, a particularly uh, advanced civilization. Um, uh, so the Etruscans are flourishing um, in, the, in the 7th century um, BC. Um, now, uh, uh, they are taking advantage of the um, mining, the mining resources that are in Etruria, the agricultural resources, and they're also going all across the Mediterranean um, we, we have evidence of the Etruscans in, in Sardinia and Corsica and Sicily. They are trading, they are raiding, they are pirates, they are serving as mercenaries. 
Um, uh, they are an extremely entrepreneurial people. Um, now, the Etruscans are not politically unified. So there are there's over a dozen Etruscan city-states. Um, and indeed, we, we have evidence of Etruscan sort of uh, expanding, Etruscan expansion, but it's not state-level expansion. It seems to be expansion by individuals, by families, by uh, informal uh, uh, war bands or, or trading associations, but we do have evidence of Etruscan activity going uh, by the 5th century all the way out north into the Po River Valley before the Celts come in and push them back down and into, uh, into Latium as well. Um, indeed, uh, a good number of the kings of Rome um, may have either Etruscan names or Etruscan origin. Um, so, uh, and again, it's not because necessarily the Etruscans conquer Rome, but it seems because there are some Etruscan adventurers who may for a time manage to get themselves perched um, as uh, in the office of king as king of Rome. Um, so the Etruscans have left behind uh, magnificent tombs, which you can still go and see today. Um, these tomb complexes uh, suggest the development of a coherent aristocracy um, with a shared ideology, the fact that they are building their tombs together in sort of communal cemeteries suggests a high degree of aristocratic solidarity. Um, and we also see monument monumentalization of Etruscan city state. I mean, the aristocrats aren't just going off into their corner, uh, to their country house and sort of building castles for themselves. Um, instead, they are coming together to form communities and are clearly coordinating the use of resources um, to create things like um, uh, paved plazas um, uh, and, and presumably other forms of monumental architecture, perhaps, around them. So, and, and, and we see this in the Etruscan, some of the Etruscan city-states that have been um, uh, excavated. Um, we know that Etruscan art, because of the, of the way that the Etruscan tombs have been preserved, um, uh, the Etruscans, when they bury their dead, will oftentimes feast in the actual tomb, and they'll feast by cooking on a, a charcoal uh, brazier. Then, with the brazier still burning, they'll seal the tomb, and the brazier will burn all the oxygen, and, and in the process, preserve the tomb uh, to an incredible degree. So we have incredible wall paintings that are preserved in these tombs, um, artifacts that would otherwise uh, degrade completely. We find in, uh, 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 quite well preserved, including an enormous amount of Greek pottery. A lot of the Greek pottery that is in a fine state of preservation that you see in a museum as, oh, look, a nice Greek pot is actually an imported Greek pot um, that has been found in an Etruscan tomb. So the Etruscans are extremely well tied in to Mediterranean trade networks, and they're importing an incredible amount of Greek luxury goods that are, that are sta high status goods in Etruscan society um, in the, in the uh, 7th and, and 6th and, and, and into the 5th centuries um, uh, BC. So the Etruscans of, of kind of all the cultural groups in Italy um, are doing the, you know, if, if you just beam down in the 6th century, they are doing the best, even though they're not politically unified and are in fact fragmented into uh, various uh, city-states, a cluster of city-states, many of which have interlocking, uh, uh, pr probably have interlocking um, relations, uh, but which are, are not, there, again, there is no Etruscan state or Etruscan empire. Um, now, and the other kind of big civilization are the Greeks. And indeed, one thing that really is going to shape Italy, both culturally um, uh, and, and economically, um, is a Greek diaspora um, that is really uh, emerging in the 8th and 7th and into the 6th centuries BC. Um, waves of, for want of a better word, colonization, although again, a lot of it does not seem to be state-level colonization, but rather seems to be, again, individuals, associations, groups. Uh, it's a very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, form of colonization. As Greeks head out looking for um, uh, trading opportunities, uh, mercenary service, um, uh, agriculture to, 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 to seize and, uh, uh, and farm agricultural land out beyond Greece, where the, it, you know, one of the, the things that starts happening around the 8th century is the population of Greece does seem to start growing, and that's going to put pressure on the oftentimes limited and marginal land in Greece. So we have a, a huge Greek diaspora that is, that is uh, 
going in many directions, going up to the Black Sea, um, but a lot of it is targeting into is targeted in southern Italy and Sicily. This is going to create Greek communities. Um, these communities also have the city-state model, um, and this also means that from an early point, a lot of Greek cultural forms, whether it's material culture like pottery, again, the kind of pottery we discover in Etruscan tombs, to religion, including the, the myths that uh, Italians use to describe their own gods, um, to, uh, to military forms like hoplite warfare. All of this is entering into Italy, probably mediated by these Greek communities um, that are in the south. Um, and one key form that is going to be very important for us as historians, I mean, in my introductory video, I stressed What's important about Rome is that they are a complex society, that they are a, 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 an empire, but they're one that we can understand because we have texts, that we can read narrative histories and, and piece things together in a way that we otherwise couldn't if we just had artifacts. But so a key information technology that, the, uh, that enters into Italy from the, again, the Greek diaspora is an alphabet. Um, now, the alphabet is actually not originally Greek. It's the product of a separate diaspora. The Greeks aren't the only people fanning across the Mediterranean in search of opportunity. They're the Phoenicians, who also have a city-state culture in the, uh, on the coastal Levant, um, are also putting out colonies um, really uh, more along the kind of southern Mediterranean. So they are in um, Sardinia, parts of Sicily, North Africa, where the Ultimately, the most important Phoenician colony is Carthage, um, going up into the southern coast of Spain. Um, and the Phoenicians have invented a new form of information technology called an alphabet. Um, and the alphabet um, uh, replaces uh, some of the, the kind of old versions of writing, many of which have gone into disuse, um, that are sort of glyphic. And this includes, uh, for example, say linear B, um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, where you need to know a huge number of symbols in order to write things down. The alphabet condenses everything into a very small number of symbols. Um, uh, now, the Phoenician alphabet doesn't have vowels. And so one of the things that the Greeks do, because the, the Greek language needs vowels to signify the the endings of Greek words tell us where that word is in the sentence, whether it's a, a verb, you know, the, the, uh, with the verb, uh, uh, the tense of the verb or the actual sort of declination of, of, of the noun. Um, so the Greeks needs, need uh, vowels, therefore. And so they simply say, well, we're going to take some of these uh, symbols that the, the Phoenicians use for consonants and we're going to make them into vowels. So uh, the Greeks, therefore, allow you, if you learn a very small number of symbols, um, you can actually start writing by sounding out the consonants and vowels and putting things together. Um, interestingly enough, our earliest example of an alphabet, of, of Greek writing with an alphabet, doesn't come from Greece, it's not from Athens or you know, Thebes or whatever, it comes from Italy, from the island of Pithecusae, where during a drinking party, it seems that a little ditty is scratched into a cup, um, and that is, that is scratching a very shaky and primitive version of the Greek alphabet, probably in the 8th century uh, BC, around, uh, around maybe 725 BC, but very close to Italy. And of course, um, uh, uh, that, that information technology does eventually jump to Italy, so the Etruscans are going to use a modified version of the Greek alphabet. The Romans are going to pick up a modified version of the Greek alphabet, and that Latin alphabet is our alphabet. So already in this, this complex interaction between not one but two diasporas across the Mediterranean. We have a Phoenician form of information technology, goes to the Greeks, through the Etruscans, and then to us. Um, and that's why uh, you, know, you, you use a Latin alphabet when you're uh, reading on your iPad. Um, uh, and also, of course, means that we will actually have a written tradition which can inform our history. So we will talk more about the peoples of early Italy uh, next time. Um, but uh, I'm going to call it a night for now. I'll talk to you soon.